us on Facebook. Welcome to our next evening in our week of prayer, Assessment, the Man and His Message. And each evening, I know quite a few of you have been watching on the live stream, either on Facebook or on YouTube. And uh, I want to shout out to Paul back there with his uh, iPhone doing the live stream on YouTube. And Mark and Pastor Jerrica and Christina running the cameras in the back there for the YouTube live. Um, we really appreciate that. But uh, when you're ready, let's have prayer, and we'll start off with some of the questions that have come in from this evening, and then we'll move into our message for tonight. Let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the blessings that you give us. I want to thank you for how you have moved so mightily during this week of prayer already. We have learned so much. And I believe that the concepts we're wrestling with, one, are very important, and two, we want to thank you for not leaving us in the, in the dark about what's going on, but giving us incredible light and insight into the events that have happened and what is going to be happening as we go forward. So we thank you. We dedicate this evening into your hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Dave, it's good to see you again. It's good to be here. Welcome, welcome back. Test, test. Yes. Um, you know, I wish all of you could sit in on the conversations we have for the rest of the day. We've had some really, really engaging and interesting conversations. But, and uh, forgive me, I'm pulling up our first question here. Uh, the first question that we had for this evening that came in is on that time of when Christ comes that we talked about last night. And they just had a follow-up question. So, how can we teach we're living in the last days if God didn't set a time limit for the plan of redemption to be completed? Even Daniel hits at time limits with the phrase, the time of the end, which we be, know began in 1798. Everything Jesus did was based on time. Why would we assume the second coming would not be on time? If you follow the work of the plan of salvation, um, boy, how to make this go quickly here? <clears throat> there, are, there, are, there are four steps, logical steps that Christ goes through, that, that the Godhead goes through to refute and to reject the accusations and the attacks of Satan. Um, you can find all four of these in Desire of Ages, in the I don't remember the chapter. I don't remember the page number, but yeah, it's, it's, okay. it's right after the, the 70 disciples have gone out and come back, and Jesus is talking. You remember they come back and they say, Master, even the devils were subject to us in, in, in your name. That's Matthew chapter 10. I don't remember 10. the chapter in Desire of Ages. Uh, yeah, yes. right. Anyhow, and uh, <clears throat> Jesus said something there that, that had always struck me as kind of strange, you know, so to speak. Yeah. The, the second thing he said always made sense. He said, no, don't rejoice that the devils are subject to you, but rejoice that your name is in the books of heaven. That made sense. But the first thing he said was, I saw, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Hmm. And it's a bit of an interesting uh, study. Um, Cameron DeVacher did a marvelous job with that material. Uh, some while back, you can find it on YouTube. I think it's called Lightning from Heaven. It's a whole series hmm. of, of talks. But there are four distinct steps in the refutation of Lucifer's work. The first was in heaven, where the Godhead saw, understood, and rejected Satan's plans. The angels, the unfallen worlds, did not understand clearly. So they were still in kind of a, huh? Sort of a stage, okay? At the cross, Ellen White says, interestingly, it says at the cross, it was as if Satan fell from heaven the second time. Because what happened is that Lucifer overreached himself so badly in killing the innocent son of God mm. that the, all the unfallen worlds were, were horrified. And they said, oh, yeah, all your well, big talk about what government you were going to run, Lucifer, we see now what you, would, what you would have done if we put you in charge. This, this is terrible. And they saw and they rejected Okay, and something now, that you brought out, if I may, just, just on that really quick, something that you brought out when we've talked about this before is it wasn't, 
it was absolutely that. But the other dimension of it was is Satan had already accused God for people dying. Right. But now he someone did. who had followed God's law perfectly still was killed by Lucifer, and it showed that he was the murderer from the beginning, right. not God. Right, right. It, it's so interesting. In Desire of Ages, it says that at the crucifixion, Lucifer revealed himself as a murderer, which means that C uh, Cain killing Abel and every other murder down through had not done that because they were all sinners, and all they had to say was, well, it's God's law. It says they have to die, not mine. So mm. he, got, he, he dodged that charge all the way down to the cross, but at the cross, he himself crucified an innocent being, hmm. someone who hadn't sinned. Okay, so anyhow, so that's the second fall. The third fall is... Which was in the eyes of the universe. In the eyes of the universe. Okay, so right. the third one, yes. Okay, so the, the third fall comes at the end of time, hopefully soon, when God's people all see and understand, the, the, God's living people, all see and understand Lucifer's um, cause, case, mm -hmm. arguments, and reject them and gain a decisive victory over him through the, the last events of, of Earth's history, and specifically uh, the time of trouble and, and the time of Jacob's trouble, where they mm. resist every temptation he can throw at them. The fourth one comes after the millennium when the wicked are raised, and they see that great panorama, and they see and understand, and they reject Lucifer. And so at the end of the game, Lucifer is entirely rejected by every single intelligent being in the universe. That's why every knee shall bow and every tongue confess. Okay. Saved and lost. What's that? Saved and lost. Saved and lost. Yes, the lost see nothing but, but the, the horror of having believed this And it's not that idea. they want to change. They wouldn't change. No, that's but right. But they understand it wasn't right. There's all sorts yeah. of things involved in that. But right. the only reason I said that part was to answer your question about timing. Okay. The end depends on us. <laughs> yeah. Up, up to the... Um, and, and, how can I put that? We have a role that delays the end. That's, that's what I mean mm. by depends. It, mm. it, it depends on Christ. Okay, we depend on Christ. God's people depend. Okay, but we have a role that is capable of delaying. No human being had a role of capa capable of delaying the, the work of Christ up through, you know, his life and his ministry. Okay? Right, right. And so now he is at the mercy of those crazy people he gave free choice to. Wow. <laughs> but he's, he's working it. He's working it. And, and that day will come. Amen. So that's, that's Amen. my answer to why the delay. And that's why Ellen White would, would say things like, you know, well, the Lord could have come before, before this now. or before this or before this, you know. But we haven't ever completed the task. And, and part of that is the promise. And I want to be a part of the generation that does, as I know you do, and I believe everyone else here. The part of that is a promise that there will arise yeah. a group of people. Sometime. And by the grace of God, we want to be a part of that, don't we? Amen. Yeah. Okay. Two minutes. Yep. Because I want to get you up by 640. Okay. Let's Here's the next one. I don't know if you can do this in two minutes, but sure. we'll see. As with Dr. Kellogg, this is a good question. What are some signs or how do we know that the Lord is calling us to do his work? As we all know, and Lucifer can be very deceptive. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. So now that's, a, that's actually a very good, uh, yeah. that's a very good basic question is, you know, how do you know God's will? How do you know what to do in mm -hmm. life? Things like mm -hmm. that. Um, okay. So volume five, page 512, okay. uh, give three, gives three um, ways we can know God's will. Just pause. You're taking notes. Volume five, page 512. Yeah. Carry on. That's an easy one to remember. 5T512. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. 5T512. I don't have it memorized, but it's, uh, what is it? it it's, it's the impressions of God's Spirit. It's um, uh, the teaching of Scripture and uh, something else. I've so I think it's the three questions. You first asked, does God command it or forbid it? Does the Bible have counsel on it? And I think, I think we're thinking of the same one. And then the third one is indications of providence. Yeah, providence. I think. Yeah, it's, providential yeah. indications. So it's, it's, it, in that order, you don't start with providential indications because right. that can get you in trouble. You start up here and you work your way right, down. Right, 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 yeah. right. There is a similar, but uh, geared a little bit more towards uh, discerning the life work type of thing. There's a thim similar statement in another easy one. I just love these. Three T, three, three, three. <laughs> <laughs> it's easy. Three T, three, three, three. Yes. Yeah, right. What does it say? And uh, it it it's it's similar and. Um, uh, 
And I don't remember how it's worded. Um, sorry about that. I, I remember the references, because I used to answer this question all the time when I was mm -hmm. teaching high school, kids trying mm -hmm. to figure out what mm -hmm. I'm supposed to do in life, things like mm -hmm. that. The book Education also has some guidelines in there. Yeah. Uh, on, there's a chapter on the life work. So mm -hmm. those, are, those are the three things that I would always point people, people to. to. to go and, that, and that progression that's brought out in 5T, 512 yeah. of, does God command it or forbid it? That's the first question. Secondly, does there... Um, wisdom that the Bible has on the topic. And then mm -hmm. third, after you've worked through both of those, then you ask, what are the indications of providence? Right. The problem is we usually jump to the indications of providence, it's, and then we go look at the Bible. It's the one that's that catches backwards. our attention first. Yeah, yeah. And, and 3T, uh, I know it, it includes the idea of, of basically, do you have a gift? Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I could, I could have all sorts of other things lined up mm -hmm. to try and convince me that I'm supposed to be some sort of a singing artist, and, and, and no, that's <laughs> That's right. And, and I, don't I don't remember. Have the gift. <laughs> There's a fourth one that I think it might be education or it might be 3T that brings out that we should counsel with people around us as well. Sure. But those are, again, under the first two. Yeah. <laughs> well, we want to get you up so that we can not be pushing the other end. Thank right. you so much for being here, and we're going to turn the time over to you for the interesting topic that we have this evening. Well, let's see what we've got. <clears throat> Okay, if we can get our screen back by chance. The uh, topic tonight is um, kind of a look at Kellogg. We're going we're gonna to take this pause in between the good Kellogg and the bad Kellogg and just try to establish the fact as to what level of significance there is to this guy. And we had the screens just a moment ago, but... Um, Technology is, should I bounce out and go back in? Okay. Uh-huh. Did it come up? Probably just the time. Okay, there we go. There we go. Okay, so let's just take, do a little assessment. This is also an opportunity to, you know, tell some interesting stories about the guy because he's, he's clearly, easily, hands down, the most fascinating single character that Adventism has produced in our history. Ellen White, of course, in her role as the prophet, you know, has a, a, a special uh, place that no one else will challenge ever, but Kellogg is, uh, is a special case, and we want to look at him, and the man and the message, so we'll, we'll touch on that. But let's begin with a, a word of prayer. Father, we ask a blessing as we stop now to, uh, to look at this one individual whom you so dearly loved and for whom you did so much. Help us to understand something of the lessons that come from his life. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so this is going to be, uh, we're going to jump around a little chronologically and it just, it's kind of a, wow, just a, a, an assortment of fascinating details. Let's start with, with this question, though, here. Why is this important? Well, Kellogg was the one who really put, quote-unquote, medical missionary work on the map. And, you know, I was a teacher for 20 years, and guess when I found this statement? After I stopped teaching. Look what it says. As religious teachers, we are under obligation to God to teach the students how to engage in medical missionary work. Well, why is that? I mean, maybe we should be under obligation to God to teach them how to cobble shoes. No. It's because medical missionary work is the way to manifest the character of, of the Father. That's, that's, the, that's what medical missionary work is what it means to embody self-denial and self-sacrifice. So she's, she's using it as a kind of a code word for a bigger, bigger thing, so to speak, okay? But this is important stuff. We are under obligation. You know, obligation means if I don't do it, there are consequences. <laughs> that's, what, that's what an obligation is, right? Okay, so we're going to start off with some things about the good Kellogg here. One of the things to, to know is really the source of his success. And um, 
In 1895, thereabouts, he was speaking with Dr. David Paulson, and he, he answered a question. I, I'm going to block that out. You're reading it already. Um, and he, uh, uh, Kellogg asked Paulson, he said, do you know how it is that I stay five years ahead of the medical profession? And Paulson said, no. No one knows how you stay five years ahead of the medical profession. And it's a little annoying because he had this reputation. He was, he was always out in front of the pack, except when the pack was charging off a cliff. And then he was standing back watching them go. And, 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 and that frustrated some people. <laughs> you, might, you might imagine. He said, when a new thing is brought out in the medical world, he knew from his knowledge or prophecy whether it belongs to him or not. It did. He instantly adopted it and advertised it while the rest of the doctors were slowly feeling their way. And when they finally adopted it, he had five years the start of them. On the other hand, when the medical profession were swept off their feet by some new fad, if it did not fit the light we had received, he simply did not touch it. When the doctors finally discovered their mistake, they wondered how Dr. Kellogg did not get caught. Kellogg's success, simply put, rose and fell with his trust in the spirit of prophecy. Uh, many, many twists and turns in that story, and it's a fascinating personal interest story, but, but that's really the bottom line, is, is right there. And for many years, many years when, well, I can give you almost a, a number on them, you know, for about eight years, <laughs> let's go that way, uh, most of the time that Ellen White was in Australia, Dr. Kellogg had the reputation, reputation of being the strongest believer of the spirit of prophecy in Battle Creek, okay? Um, those were rough years at the General Conference and at the Review and Herald. The 1890s are not, not a happy time, okay, for a whole variety of reasons. But Kellogg over at the sanitarium, you know, he'd get these letters from Ellen White over in Australia. He'd get a letter, and he'd, he'd call the staff. He'd say, I got a letter! You know, everybody come to the cafeteria tonight. And, you know, Kellogg was short. He was five foot four. So he'd stand up on top of a table in the cafeteria, and he'd read these letters from Ellen White, and he would cry, and, and the tears would come down his face. He'd say, oh, we are so blessed to have this instruction. He, he, he actually loved Ellen White. Issues arose, but let's move on. <clears throat> okay, looks like we got a little problem here, but let's, we'll straighten this out. Now, I just want to point out a, a little pattern of things that are kind of interesting. What Kellogg was doing as Ellen White was getting ready and going off to Australia was, you know, in the medical missionary work, uh, she, was, she was paying attention to that. And it fits a pattern, okay? Now, this is talking about um, the work in Australia, okay? So she went off to Australia as Kellogg was getting his medical mission work going. And she wrote this while she was there. It is God's purpose that there shall be a true pattern in Australia, a sample of how other fields shall be worked. The work should be symmetrical and a living witness for the truth. Okay, now you may have heard uh, a comment like this about Avondale College. You know, she went over to Australia and had a chance to start a whole new college, right? And so, so Avondale, she said, Avondale is to be a pattern school. We're not going to copy anything that we've done in, in, back in the States or anywhere else in the world. We're going to do it right this time. We're going we're gonna to make it as perfect as we possibly can. And then we'll establish a pattern at Avondale that the rest of the, the, the world church can copy. Well, she's saying the same thing here, <clears throat> but what's she talking about? Notice specifically the word symmetrical. Symmetrical, right? She identifies that and defines that in another place as this, the harmonious relation of parts. And specifically, you've got to have at least two. You can't be symmetrical with a single thing, right? You've got to have two aspects to something to be symmetrical. So what's she talking about? Well, fortunately, her son, Willie, filled in some details for us. It has been presented to mother that Australasia is a field in which we will do a model work, a work that will show to our friends and brethren in other lands how the evangelistic work and the medical work should be carried forward in perfect agreement, in perfect harmony, blended together. 
And this is, is an idea that, that I really want to kind of stamp into your thinking. The blended work that Jesus did, preaching and teaching and helping and healing. You've got to get both sides of that thing to be symmetrical. Okay. Yep, looks like I got that showing up that way. That's okay. Well, another example of, of the, the value of Kellogg's ideas came really much later. I mean, after, after Kellogg himself had, had wandered away and had been disfellowshipped. But Ellen White was taking Kellogg's ideas and, and charging and charging and charging in a new direction out in California. It's after she came back from Australia. And the establishment of what was known as the College of Medical Evangelists, CME, now Loma Linda. Why was that important? I mean, she committed a lot of time and effort to that. Why was that important? Well, here's a nice statement from one of the, uh, the presidents of the institution out there. He said, there seems to be, in the minds of some, a misconception as to the object of the College of Medical Evangelists. Is it to educate as the term is generally understood? It is not. There are plenty of medical schools in the world to do that work. Our object is to prepare men in the very best way to fulfill the goal. Commission, go ye in all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, and as ye go, heal the sick. When Jesus sent the disciples out, he told them to heal the sick. That was a part of the work. Why? Because it was a part of his work, and they were just copying him. So, all the way up into the, you know, the 19, well, this is 1910 in this particular example here, you know, they were well aware of this model, this blended model. And, of course, we have this statement. Christ's method alone will give true success in reaching the people. The Savior mingled with men as one who desired their good. He showed his sympathy for them, ministered to their needs, and won their confidence. And then he bade them follow me. That's, that's the model. That's the model. Okay, well, let's see. Let's go on. Uh, I, I pulled all these statements together, and so... You, sometimes you may want to almost ignore the title I up on the t uh, up on the top. I didn't get them all straightened out to to reflect a common train of thought because I pulled these in from other other uh, presentations. But you know, you can note the date and you know, that might be of interest if you have a, a mental timeline you can work with. So Ellen White writing here: the work pointed out for those in Battle Creek was for them to leave Battle Creek and work in places where there was nothing to represent the truth. Thus, plants, and that's not corn plants, right? That's church plants and institutional plants. Thus, plants would have been made in many places. God has not forsaken his people, but his people have forsaken him. Those in Battle Creek should have worked for the ones who needed their help. Dr. Kellogg took up the work they did not do. The spirit of criticism shown to his work from the first has been very unjust and has made his work hard. The lack of sympathy his brethren have shown him has prepared the way for the work he has been doing in criticizing them. The Lord has no justification for any such work. Dr. Kellogg got a, a, an unfortunately high level of opposition and criticism and pushback in the early years of his work. And it slowly but surely separated his heart from the hearts of his brethren. Let's put it that way, okay? And by 1898, he had, he had begun now... To, to criticize the ministry because sometimes they, you know, they didn't support him too well and there were a lot of things that just really, really bugged him, you know, and, and they could have supported him, they should have supported him, he was doing God's work. Unfortunately, and not all were opposing him, don't get me wrong, I'm not classifying all ministers as, you know, at even at that time, whatever, you know, I'm certainly not speaking to all ministers today. But it was enough. The devil doesn't need to win every battle. He just needs to win enough battles to mess everything up, right? It was enough that Kellogg began to become critical of the ministry. Had the church done in different localities the work given them by God, had they followed the example left them by Christ, there would now be centers all through America. Plants would be established in many places. There would not be a great showing in Chicago alone. The work would be multiplied in many places with the full cooperation of the institutions established in Battle Creek. So as Kellogg got more annoyed with the ministry, 
I don't have his words saying this, but in actions, it's basically like he said, those dumb ministers, I will outdo them. I'll do more missionary work. I'll do more Christian work. I'll do, I'll do better than they all could ever dream of. And, and so he went down to Chicago and started the Chicago City Mission and began doing a very large work. It was not productive, particularly productive, in terms of... Uh, evangelistic success it was yeah it, it, he fed a lot of people who were hungry he helped some people quit their alcohol he quote unquote converted you know some people they gave their heart to the Lord but you know it, it's 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 tough if you've been a drunk for 30 years you know it's, it's great if you give your heart to the Lord but you've unfortunately done a lot of damage and it's hard to go very far with with what's left sometimes but anyhow the past should be keen for keen regret the Lord would now have the medical mission work recognized as the helping hand of God but this work has been carried too heavily in one place when plants should have been made in many places and so you can see the problem that was developing no she says the work should now be recognized as the helping hand of God which is to say that up to this point it had not been recognized largely as the helping uh, the helping hand of God because it wasn't receiving the proper recognition that God's work deserved that's why Kellogg went down to Chicago and started investing time and effort and personnel too heavily in one place we should have been having dozens of little operations scattered all across the country and around the world and that's that's just kind of an overview of the the arc of the whole thing those who refused the warnings of God followed a course of action which brought its sure result. These influences have sometimes made the work of Dr. Kellogg doubly as hard as it should have been. They have led him to stand apart to some degree from the ministry. I desire to present matters as they are presented to me. Such a spirit of criticism and fault finding has done the work Satan designed should be done. Dr. Kellogg has been led to take the course he deemed it his duty to take. He has not connected with those who were not in sympathy with the work he knew to be of God. This is huge. Kellogg was starting to draw away from the ministry because they didn't support him as, as much. I mean, as a group, they didn't support him as much as they should. And so he, he thought it was his duty. He says, I know. I know what God has called me to do. They are op opposing what God has called for. Therefore, I cannot connect with them. Follow the logic? At some level, there's truth to that. Can two walk together except they be agreed, right? You wouldn't team up in a business venture with somebody that's opposing God's work. But you know, one of the hardest tests that anybody ever faces is the terribly difficult test of staying true to your calling to God's work and not giving up on your brethren and your sisters who don't see it as clearly as you do. That's, 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 that's really hard, okay? James White, in his final years, really faced that challenge. He was very discouraged by it sometimes. Of course, bear in mind, he'd had numerous strokes, and he was, he was struggling with his, his health, you know. And, and on top of his physical health problems, it didn't seem that he was being supported by other people, right? And that was, that was a big problem to him. Um, Jones and Wagner, Ellen White says the same thing, is that, is that, that people opposed their work, their, their preaching, their teaching, and... She says, you know, it's possible that they may lose their hold on God because of this opposition and, and go out. But it will largely be the fault of those who opposed them, who, who did not you know, recognize the work of God. It's always going to be the case. This was, this was the same problem that Jesus had on the, on the night in Gethsemane. You know, you can't, you can't stay awake one hour even with me? He was looking for human support. Everybody looks for, for the support of their brethren. 
It's a tough challenge. Just be aware of it, because it may come to you someday. Right? There's a beautiful passage. It shows up in a number of different places, actually, where Ellen White talks about what, what we historically refer to as the Sabbath conferences. They started in 1848 and went for two and a half years into the spring of, of 1850. This is where our doctrines were hammered out. And there were Joseph Bates, James and Ellen White, uh, Father Pierce. He's not a Catholic priest. He was just an older man, so they called him Father. Um, uh, the Beldons. No, not the Beldons. What's the name I want? Um, Ed... Uh, Edson, Hiram Edson. Hiram Edson was involved. Um, a few others, I can't think of all the names. They would get together and they'd have these, these meetings and these, these studies and they'd try and figure things out. And it's, it's, a, it's a great account. There's all sorts of fascinating things she pulls out of it. But she has this, fa this, this amazing comment. She says, Sometimes one of the brethren would act out the natural feelings of the heart. That's a very discreet way of saying he was a being a bit of a jerk, okay? <laughs> he would act out the natural feelings of the heart, and he would stubbornly resist everyone else. When this spirit appeared, she said, we would adjourn the meeting and part with expressions of friendliness to study the matter independently, individually, and come back together again as soon as possible to, to continue studying. We loved Jesus. We loved one another. And we had to maintain our unity. And so that's, a, that's just, just an incredibly ch hard challenge to, to do what you know is right, to receive opposition, and yet, you know, not every time somebody doesn't see me exactly the light that I think they should, it doesn't necessarily mean they've committed the unpardonable sin. I don't have to excommunicate them every time, okay? So, okay, let's go on. Our people have not all appreciated as they should the man through whom God has worked and with whom he has cooperated upon the subject of health reform. They have not reasoned from cause to effect to understand how great was the blessing of the sanitarium at Battle Creek under the management of Dr. Kellogg and his faithful associates. Through this work, the truths of the third angel's message have entered where it would otherwise have been very difficult for them to find entrance. But the perceptions of our people have been blinded. So this is, this is the challenge Kellogg was working with for quite a number of years. So what happened? Well, by about 1900, things were starting to go downhill, unfortunately. This letter was written to the General Conference president, actually. Seek to save Dr. Kellogg from himself. He is not heeding the counsel he should heed. He is not satisfied because the Lord has signified that the missionary work does not consist alone in the slum work in Chicago. That work, thought to be the great and important thing to be done, is a very defective and expensive work. It's, it, and again, this is another case of real fascinating balance. That work right there that she's talking about, she says, is something that should always be done by a few. By a few. God will always call some to that work. And every time they win a soul from, from the depths of degradation, the angels sing. But, she says, it's not the work for everyone. And it's certainly not the work for all our church finances. And that's where Kellogg was headed with this thing, okay? So it's a matter of balance. We, we, we so commonly, we want to make everything kind of black and white. and That's wrong. Don't do that. No, no, no. It, it is right. Just don't do it in that kind of overblown proportion. God does not endorse... Oh, th now this is fascinating. I'm going to stop that one too for just a moment. This is 1903, this particular statement. At the general conference session of 1903, in a public meeting addressing, you know, of course, a general conference session, of, a lot of the ministers were there. I don't know what percentage of the audience would have been ministers, but a lot of the ministers were there. 1903. That's a year after Kellogg had written his book, Living Temple, which we haven't discussed yet, but you probably have heard of already somewhere else, anyhow. It was not a good book. It had traces of pantheism in it. And a year after he wrote that book, Ellen White is still defending Dr. Kellogg. She is not defending pantheism. She is defending a gentleman who had traces of pantheism in his thinking. But the opposition of his brethren 
was making it so that she could not deal with him on the other issues. So notice what she says. God does not endorse the work. The efforts put forth by different ones to make the work of Dr. Kellogg as hard as possible in order to build themselves up. God gave the light on health reform, and those who rejected it, rejected God. One and another who knew better said, it all came from Dr. Kellogg, and they made war upon him. This had a bad influence on the doctor. I love the understatement there. Somebody's shooting at me and dropping bombs. That could be a bad influence. I might not be happy. <laughs> this had a bad influence on the doctor. He put on the coat of irritation and retaliation. God did not want him to stand in a position of warfare, and he does not want you to stand there. 1903. Amazing. Yeah, whatever. Again and again, the Lord has pointed out the work which the church in Battle Creek and those all through America are to do. They are to reach a much higher standard in spiritual advancement than they have yet reached. They are to awake out of sleep and go without the camp, working for souls that are ready to perish. The medical missionary workers are doing the long-neglected work which God gave to the church in Battle Creek. They're giving the last call to the supper, which he has prepared. In order to be carried forward to right, the medical missionary work needs talent. It requires strong, willing hands and wise, discriminating management. But can this be while well, those in responsible places, presidents of conference and ministers, bar the way? The Lord says to the presidents of conferences and to other influential brethren, remove the stumbling blocks that have been placed before the people. I have been instructed to refer our people to the 58th chapter of Isaiah. Read this chapter carefully and understand the kind of ministry that will bring life into the churches. When you meet suffering souls who need help, give it them. When you find those who are hungry, feed them. And in doing this, you will do it in lines of Christ's ministry. The Master's holy work was a benevolent work. Let our people everywhere be encouraged to have a part in it. Okay. Those who wait for the bridegroom's coming are to say to the people, Behold your God. Now, the interesting question there is, Behold your God, where are they supposed to look? You know? Everybody stand around and stare, you know. I don't know, I don't see him. Behold your God. That's quoting Isaiah, by the way. Behold. Those who wait for the bridegroom's coming are to say to the people, to the worldly people, Behold your God. The last rays of merciful light, the last message of mercy to be given to the world is a revelation of his character of love. Great, but where are they supposed to see it? The children of God are to manifest his glory, his character. In their own life and character, they are to reveal what the grace of God has done for them. And how can you do that? The only way Jesus did. Blended ministry. Preaching, teaching, helping, healing. This one just kind of terrifies me somewhat. The sufferings of every man are the sufferings of God's child. And those who reach out no helping hand to their perishing fellow beings provoke his righteous anger. This is the wrath of the Lamb. That, that's kind of serious. I don't want to end up on the wrong side of the wrath of the Lamb. People need help. We need to help them. God's purpose in committing to men and women the mission that he committed to Christ is to disentangle his followers from all worldly policy and to give them a work identical with the work that Christ did. Identical. Yeah, that's a pretty strong word. <laughs> identical. Now, that doesn't mean we've you know, we got to wear a robe and sandals, I don't think. It doesn't mean that we will always be working in miraculous ways, as Jesus did. But it is still identical in presenting the character of God and the only way it can be done. It's a blended ministry. Let us remember that it is not by word and precept alone that we are to reveal Christ's character. Our works must bear witness to his indwelling presence in the heart. Blended ministry, right? His disposition, his kindness, his compassion manifested in our actions will inspire hopes in the minds and hearts of the most hopeless. Thus, in act, as well as in word, we shall reveal to the world the character of the unseen. That's what Jesus did when he was here. He revealed the Father through a blended ministry. 
I have been instructed to refer our people to the 58th chapter. Uh, we already had this. Okay, that's a repetition. So here's an interesting comment. She, she's just talking, and she just told the, the story of the Good Samaritan. Then she says this. Here, the conditions of inheriting eternal life are plainly stated by our Savior in the most simple manner. The man who was wounded and robbed represents those who are subjects of our interest, sympathy, and charity. If we neglect the cases of the needy and the unfortunate that are brought under our notice, no matter who they may be, we have no assurance of eternal life, for we do not answer the claims that God has upon us. Now this is a, this statement, <clears throat> taken all by itself, could lead us to Kellogg's kind of a position. I will help every poor person. I will help every... And I think it may be important. Notice there she says, the unfortunate that are brought under our notice. I, I may be wrong in putting too much emphasis on that. But I really think that we are to be, um, how can I say, intelligently observant and, and careful to notice who God brings us in contact with, okay? Especially at this level of the, 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 the poor, the needy, we're not to shun contact with them, but those who are brought under our notice, those with whom the Lord opens the door and brings us to. The truth is, sadly, that there are many poor who, through the condition of our society, I would suppose, have come to a point where they no longer respond to assistance with any gratitude. And I just want to throw that out as a, what I use as a, a marker in my mind. If I am doing benevolent work that fails to generate gratitude, I'm wasting God's money. It's sad. And I don't want to make a, necessarily a snap decision on an individual on a single instance. You know, there may be, maybe somebody's a bit jaded and it takes a little time, you know. But if, if I'm in a situation where I am expending God's money and it's being taken with no sense of gratitude over and over again, I'm, I'm wasting it. And, and perhaps even worse, I, you know, Ellen White speaks of, you know, you can actually do harm with your charity that way because you're teaching people to depend on that which they have no, no right to, they have not earned, they have no, you know, whatever. So it's not good. Uh, sadly, I would say that, you know, our, our welfare system has stolen the mandate of the church and has conditioned the minds of the population to be ungrateful. Nobody gets a welfare check and says, oh, I love my government. They don't say that. At least, I've never seen it. Read Isaiah 58. This, is a, this one's this pointed. Read Isaiah 58, ye who claim to be children of the light. Especially do you read it again and again who have felt so reluctant to inconvenience yourselves by favoring the needy. You whose hearts and houses are too narrow to make a home for the homeless. Read it. You who can see orphans and widows oppressed by the iron hand of poverty bowed down by hard-hearted worldlings, read it. Are you afraid that an influence will be introduced into your family that will cost you more labor? Read it. Your fears may be groundless. And a blessing may come, known and realized to you, by you every day. You know, sometimes you, you help someone else and they turn out to be more of a help to you. Sometimes. Sometimes not. But if otherwise, if extra labor is called for, you can draw upon one who has promised, then shall thy light break forth as the morning, and thine health shall spring forth speedily. That's Isaiah 58. You can depend on that promise. The reason God's people are not more spiritually minded and have not more faith I have been shown is because they are narrowed up with selfishness. The prophet is addressing Sabbath keepers. Remember Isaiah 58, if you turn your way a foot from the Sabbath? Not sinners, not unbelievers, but those who make great pretensions to godliness. It is not the abundance of your meetings that God accepts. It's not the numerous prayers, but the right doing, doing the right thing and at the right time. It is to be less self-caring and more benevolent. 
Our souls must expand. Then God will make them like a watered garden whose waters fail not. Isaiah 58 again. There is a real place that we have not always filled for benevolent work, which just means helping people. Well, <clears throat> stop right there for just a minute. So, assessment, the man and the message. We've kind of looked through you know, a little bit about the man. We've looked through a little bit about his message. I think it makes a strong case for the value of it. Now, we're actually, this is a spoiler almost for tomorrow night, but we, I want you to see how significant he was on both sides of the divide. This letter was written to the General Conference President. In those days of apostasy, it is not John Kellogg that you are dealing with. It is a being that once figured in the courts of heaven as an exalted angel. The poor doctor is not in his right mind. Kellogg became more identified with Satan than anyone else Ellen White ever wrote anything about. For a long time, Dr. Kellogg has not been humbly accepting Christ as a teacher and unknown to himself has been taught by the master of sophistries. So long has he walked apart from God that he knows not that he's been walking and working after the counsel of one who deceived, uh, counsel of one who worked in a deceptive manner in heaven until he was cast out. I was instructed that the one who was operating his mind was the one who once was an exalted angel in heavenly courts, the one who was a covering cherub. It is Satan's theories that are now coming to the front from the lips of Dr. Kellogg. He is lost and has been lost for a long while while in the misconceptions that he has long cherished. At the Oakland General Conference, that would have been 1903, I could not explain fully why I was to have no conversation with Dr. Kellogg. It was because satanic agencies were communicating with him. And much that I might have said would have been misstated and misinterpreted. I just have to tell you a story because, man, it's so easy for me to lose the balance. General Conference, Oakland, California, 1903. Ellen White left one day before it was over. The day before, I believe it was, Sarah McIntyre, for Ellen White's assistant lady, went to two doctors, Dr. David Paulson and Dr. Uh, Sanford P.S. Edwards. And she said, Mother, that's what they always called Ellen White, Mother is leaving tomorrow on the 3 o'clock train from, I don't know, such, such and such a station. She would like you and your wives to come visit at Elmshaven. Please get on the 315 train from another station down the tracks. In other words, she doesn't want anybody to see you getting on the train with her. So they got on the train. Ellen White was sitting in the car. They came in. They sat down. She looked at them. She smiled once. She looked out the window. Said not a word. Train gets up to... Is it Calistoga? I forget where the train stopped up there near Elmshaven, wherever it was. Ellen and Sarah got off and... Uh, Sarah helped Ellen to the, the carriage that was waiting for her and came back and spoke to the doctors and their wives. And she says, uh, arrangements will be made for you to stay up the hill at the sanitarium if you could come to Elmshaven to, to visit with Mother tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock. Okay. So the way they go up the hill to, uh, to the sanitarium, they spent the night, and they just talked and back and forth between themselves. And what's going on? And nobody knew what was going on. And bear in mind at this point, Dr. David Paulson was a strong supporter of Dr. Kellogg. Okay. The next morning, 10 o'clock, they're there, knock on the door, they come in. If you've ever visited Elmshaven, you know, it's that, that first part of the room around to the right in the doorway. And they came in, they sat down, Ellen White was sitting there, and she looked at them and she said, Dr. Edwards, your mother was such a wonderful woman. I remember when you were born. She says, I actually, I babysat you when you were about three a couple of times. Yes, you had a wonderful moment. And I remember the time that we met at the camp meeting in such and such a place, and, and uh, I think you were singing in the choir. Didn't you sing in the choir? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I remember the time, and I remember this time, and I remember that time. And Dr. Paulson, I remember when you first came to Battle Creek and such and such. She spent a whole hour just going through everything she remembered about them, just, just chitting, chatting, having a friendly conversation. And after an hour, she stopped for a moment, and she looked at me, and she says, I suppose you're wondering why I've called you here. 
And they're kind of like, uh, yeah, 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 we're wondering. <laughs> and she says, I suppose you wonder why I've called you here. Dr. Kellogg may be lost. I pray that he won't be. But if he is, let it be with your hands on his shoulders holding him back. Thank you so much for coming. God bless you. That's what she did about this guy, right? The one that was communicating with the satanic agencies. <laughs> she worked really hard to save him. Soon after the conference, the the Lord portrayed before me a scene in which Satan, clothed in a most attractive disguise, was earnestly pressing close to the side of Dr. Kellogg. I saw and heard much. Night after night I was bowed down in agony of soul as I saw this personage talking with our brother. I was instructed that notwithstanding the warnings, counsels, and reproofs given, he has followed his own way when, we, when as a people we have been receiving instruction to advance in an opposite direction. In the place of cooperating with the angels of heaven, he has cooperated with evil angels. On several occasions, I have seen one in disguise linked up with you. This is a letter to Kellogg. And presenting matters before you in a perverted light. In the future, he will work more decidedly upon your mind unless you choose to be transformed by being born again. When you are under the spiritualistic influence of the wily foe, you are liable to say anything about anyone. For the seducer uses you as an agent through whom to voice his words, as, the, as in the Garden of Eden, he used the serpent through which to address our first parents. When under Satan's power you make false representations after the spell is broken and others repeat to you the words that have, you have uttered, you deny everything. Whereas the very words spoken are the words that in the visions of the night I have heard you speak for effect. Words that are untrue but that you cannot help speaking when you are under the influence of satanic agencies. At such times you have no control over mind or spirit and are as fully under the influence of evil agencies as the converted are under the influence of the Holy Spirit. When he is worked by satanic agencies, he does not know, know what has got, got of him and has been to the church some time. Satan links up with Dr. Kellogg, imbues with the evil devisings. Our erring brother will suggest many things that have not the inspiration or the sanction of the Holy Spirit of God. I saw a satanic agency working with Dr. Kellogg imparting to him the false science the enemy used to in heaven to deceive the angels. We'll be looking at that tomorrow night. My heart was filled with sorrow because of the course that John Harvey Kellogg and A.T. Jones is following the same course and voicing the same sentiments with the most determined spirit. When a realization of this comes over me with such force, great sorrow fills my soul. I have before me such a revival of the first great apostasy in the heavenly courts that I am bowed down with an agony that cannot be expressed. Do you see why we started with Lucifer? Writing to the General Conference, she said, Read in Patriarchs and Prophets and Great Controversy the history of the first great apostasy. The instruction that these books contain was printed for your admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. It was this secretive power of the scientific operation of mind upon mind that I had to meet under the direction of the Spirit of God. I am so sorry that so many valuable minds have been already spoiled. There are those who will never come out of the darkness of infidelity through Dr. Kellogg's seed sowing. This deceptive spiritualistic influence exercised over God's servants was similar to the influence that was exercised by Satan in the Garden of Eden. A study of patriarchs and prophets and great controversy will show the way in which Satan worked that men living in these last days with the Old and New Testaments in their possession should act out the very same representation as shown me in warnings and reproofs given me in vision for our people is wonderfully strange. To me, wonderful, not meaning, oh, that's great, but wonderfully as in you wonder what in the world's going on. Read in my books, Patriarch's Prophets, Great Con First Great Apostasy, history is being repeated and will be repeated. Read then and understand the time is drawing to a close when power of influence, of intellect, of knowledge in science can cover the least departure from the Lord's way. Please read the first chapter of Patriarchs and Prophets and see if the precious truths contained in this book are not given by the Lord to protect his people from deceptions that are urged upon them just now. One of the things that was really sad was so many people who were close to Kellogg who never did anything to help him. Dr. Kellogg's associates should not be mere shadows of Dr. Kellogg 
for this is the danger. Should the substance be removed, nothing would remain to make the shadow. They would say, they would not say yea, they should not say yea to his every proposition. In other words, they were yes men, right? That's what she's saying. They should never consent to be mere machines run by another man's brains. God has given them ability to think and to act. He would have them strong, firm, whole-souled, well-balanced men. And they should not be crippled or dwarfed in their knowledge for want of practice. Practical training is essential for all who will become efficient, who would become efficient and whole. If students could spend some time in a hospital, they would obtain an experience of great value to them. Um, could have left that last off. That's going into something else. I'm not going to take time to discuss. But this idea of Kellogg's associates, she says, they did not stand up and say, Dr. Kellogg, that is wrong, when they knew that it was wrong. Because he was, he was such a nice guy. He, he really was. He was a generous, generous, generous guy. He'd give you the clothes off his back. He, put, he, he paid to put 50 people, at least, through medical school, we know. He, his wife raised 42 kids. He was a generous guy. They liked him. But he was a strong personality, and they need, he needed somebody to stand in his way and say, Doctor, that's wrong. You can't do that. And no one did. It's hard to stand up to authority. Sometimes it has to be done. The strangest part of it is that his associates, the physicians right around him, seemed to act as though they were paralyzed, as though they did not know enough to tell him, you are on the wrong track. They are afraid to do it. And I want to tell you in the name of the Lord, if we do not stand up to the standard God has given us, everyone will be in that position. Fastened amid the delusions of these last days are the associates, plastering things all over just as though he was a saint when the works have been going on and they have known it, but they would not put their hand upon it. So that's a, so yeah, that's a problem. Dr. Kellogg has presented to me with an attendant hovering about, very busy, and it is the same that visited the Holy Pair in Eden, was their counselor to partake of the forbidden fruit. The man has his advisor. It is one who was once the covering cherub in the heavenly courts, and notwithstanding for years this seducing spirit has led Dr. Kellogg Yet his associates have permitted themselves to be blinded, and they have sustained him and confirmed him. You can't do that. If all men had been true and faithful to Dr. Kellogg, he might have been, yes, would have been, in a far different position religiously from what he is now in. There was a work to be done under the influence of the Holy Spirit to arrest the growing unbelief and infidelity which was making itself felt. But words were not spoken by Dr. Kellogg's associates to arrest and prevent this growing infidelity. Our physicians have been warned against the seducing power of satanic agencies, and yet they are sustaining Dr. Kellogg. The enemy seduced the angels, and they thought he was right. We have the result of their choice, and yet the same rebellion against God is going on today. <clears throat> now, this is an interesting statement. <clears throat> I really like this one for a variety of reasons. It, it, it just shows some fascinating things. This is, a, this is a letter written by Willie White. And what he's talking about is how hard his mother was working to try and save Dr. Kellogg. It reflects well on Dr. Kellogg. It reflects well on Ellen White. And just the way that, that Willie wrote it, without a touch of envy or anything, I think it reflects especially well on... on Elder William White, Willie C. White. He says, I do not believe there is a person living, not even her own sons, for whom mother would do more to help, to encourage, to correct, and to instruct than Dr. Kellogg. Why is this? Because God has given him great ability, great opportunities, great responsibilities. And his mother has told me several times during this last winter, Dr. Kellogg stands where he can do more to relieve the perplexities of the present situation than any other living man. And two, he stands where he can do more to bring confusion, perplexity, and backsliding than any other living man. And I have carried the burden of his case on my soul day and night because I know that so much is involved in the decisions he shall make and the course he shall take. Dr. Kellogg was not just a normal guy. I don't know why, I don't know how, but you know, the Lord makes some vessels to honor and you know, some vessels not so much honor, right? Dr. Kellogg was to be a special person. And he ended up being a special person. 
just unfortunately mostly on the wrong side. A man having the influence that you have, she's writing to Dr. Kellogg now, a man whose name has become so popular can do us as a people great injury if you are permitted by God. But the Lord, he is God. And it will be shown that he has spoken, saying, Thus far shall you, J.H. Kellogg, go and no further. Dr. Kellogg's case has been a mystery of mysteries, that which has given power to his work, truth and righteousness, he has discarded. The cause of God has been hindered in its advance, in its advance by the only one who could do a work so counter to the work the Lord would have done at this stage of our history. His people are now, many of them, confused by the subtle reasoning that has been presented. If ministers of the gospel are bewildered and receive the false sentiments made, what can be expected of the churches? And that's where I want to leave it tonight. Just about on time. I hope you, you grasp the value, the importance, the beauty of what the Lord tried to accomplish with Dr. Kellogg, and unfortunately the magnitude of what the devil accomplished to Dr. Kellogg. So tomorrow night, we'll come back and we'll look more specifically at Dr. Kellogg's decline and apostasy and the results that remain to this day because of that. Pastor? Wow. Some sobering thoughts. I think of what... Um, my grandma would often say, there but for the grace of God go each one of us. But the grace of God is we allow him to protect us. I always enjoy the positive stories, but God is gracious enough to include the fallings to warn us. I'm inspired by David slaying the giant but I'm rebuked by David as he fell into sin. Same is true here. Thank you for being here. Let the Holy Spirit press home to your heart the warning that God in his mercy has left on record for us. Tomorrow evening, we continue on. We're almost done. I guess we have three more nights and then we finish. It's going to go by quickly. But I hope that you can make it back. If you're watching on the live stream, I want to encourage you to come. God is opening our minds to vital pieces of truth. Would you stand with me as we pray? Oh, Father, what an incredible message. A community, city uplifting, live, lives transforming, work and message and calling that you've given to us, your people. And you raised up Kellogg to stand at the head of the health work. And for a time, he shone brightly. Father, he allowed pride to come in, and it got in the way, and it led him to fall, fall far. I believe that you've called us here in this church to do a great work in this city, in this community. Don't let pride get in the way. Pray that you'll forgive us where we have allowed pride to come in. You will replace it the humility of Jesus to humbly, faithfully, lovingly we will do the work that you've called us to do to share Christ with this community. Thank you. In Jesus' wonderful name we say, pray. Amen. On your way out, we have the two books available. Um, one of them is on sale for fifteen. The other, they're both actually uh, on sale for fifteen dollars. Um, Tactics, which is what we're going through this week of prayer. The other is Tremble, which is um, looking at the Alpha and the Omega, 
and uh, which we'll be getting in a little bit later, I think, in the series. Little are free. Yes. Well, little booklets are free, one per family. Um, I, I don't have any change yet. I will have change after the first person buys with cash. Um, but Lord bless you. Good night, and we'll see you tomorrow evening.